This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. As the Russian invasion of Ukraine enters its second week, we turn now to look at how the Biden administration is responding to the crisis. Biden's repeatedly condemned Russia's invasion and imposed unprecedented sanctions on Russia in what some have described as a form of economic warfare. While President Biden's ruled out sending troops into Ukraine, the U.S. is directly aiding Ukraine militarily. CNN's reporting the U.S. has recently delivered hundreds of Stinger anti-aircraft missiles to Ukraine for the first time. President Biden to questions outside the White House Wednesday. Do you support permanent U.S. military presence in Poland and other Eastern European countries now, after what's happening in Ukraine? In Ukraine? We've always been there. We've always been all the NATO countries. I'm talking about permanent bases. No, I, that's a decision for NATO to make. Do you, you think they're considering getting rid of vaccine mandates? I'm sorry. Mr. President, are you considering banning Russian oil in Poland? Uh, nothing is off the table. We're joined now by Matt Duss, foreign policy advisor for Senator Bernie Sanders. He's also a Ukrainian-American. His father was born in Germany in a displaced persons camp after World War II, after his family fled Ukraine. Matt Duss, welcome to Democracy Now! Can you respond, first of all, just to the overall situation, and then particularly to the U.S. response and what needs to be done? Well, I mean, I think your previous guest described, you know, the hor horrifying situation in Ukraine right, right now, which is just we've just passed over a week of this Russian invasion. Um, we're seeing more shelling uh, of, of Ukrainian cities. Um, and this is from, you know, Putin justified this invasion, uh, claiming that he was there to liberate uh, you know, Russians and, 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 and Ukrainians from a fascist government. Um, we don't need to tick through all the various justifications he's given, but I think Ukrainians are obviously knew that was false, but I think we Russian soldiers themselves now um, should be questioning whether that's false. Uh, as for the U.S. response, I think we've seen you know, even in the in the months and certainly the weeks leading up to the invasion, a very energetic diplomatic response from the United States uh, to work with with allies in Europe, NATO allies, but not only NATO allies, with allies in uh, in Asia, um, to prepare a, a sanctions response. Um, I think that sanctions response has been extremely aggressive. Um, it's it's become you know not just sanctions on Putin and his his government and and oligarchs around Putin, but over the week we saw you know serious sanctions you know cutting off a number of banks from the SWIFT system as your previous guest uh, mentioned, but also effectively blocking sanctions on the central bank of of Russia. Um, so these are very very serious measures, and I think we will have to watch now how how Putin decides to respond. Well, Matt, uh, as you know, uh, many have called for more, uh, many in Ukraine have called for minimally more punitive sanctions, including uh, an embargo on oil and gas exports. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Europe is, of course, dependent uh, for most of its gas and oil, 40 and 30 percent, respectively, uh, from uh, uh, Russia. And Russia's revenues, of course, uh, also come from the sale of this, uh, uh, these oil and gas reserves. Could you uh, talk about whether you think that's likely, and even if these sanctions are imposed, whether that is likely to deter Russia? Right. No, I think there are, there are two things there. One, there is it likely, and I, I, I want to say it's, it's very possible, although that is something that is going to hit European countries much, much harder, and frankly, it's going to hit the United States much harder. Um, and, you know, it's going to raise the price of gas. It's going to raise the price of goods. Um, that's certainly not an argument against it. I mean, I think if we are serious about imposing costs on the Russian government and on Vladimir Putin, that is, as the president, as President Biden said in, in, in the press uh, remarks that you, you just played, everything is on the table. Um, I think it also gets at the importance, ultimately, and this is something uh, my boss, Senator Sanders, has talked about, to use this moment um, to shift more aggressively to green energy and deny these authoritarian regimes, not just uh, Putin, but a uh, you know, broader set of uh, petro states, the revenues they require um, to, to, to rule. Um, but getting to the second point, how does this impact Putin's calculation, the Russian government's calculation? That is a real uh, you know that's that's a that's a question I have as well. Um, I think Putin has unfortunately laid out a number of very very expansive goals 
um, and has not really left himself. I mean, it's hard to see how he would climb down um, from, the, from the very expansive uh, agenda he's laid out. Uh, many of your listeners are probably aware of the speech that he gave uh, last week on the eve of the uh, of the invasion, where he kind of laid out his theory that you know Ukraine is not a real country and this is part of the you know the kind of Russian imperium as he defines it. You know, and he would not be the first leader to walk back from some very wild um, you know this kind of wild agenda. But as of right now, uh, it's unclear to me how he might do that. And we should also be you know, very mindful of the impact that these sanctions are going to make, not just on the regime, but on Russian working people themselves. Um, this is, a, I think, a, a broader concern that progressives have about these kinds of sanctions tools, because if the theory of the case is that, you know, you will you know, put pressure on the people who will in turn put pressure on their rulers, it's not quite clear how exactly that works when you're dealing with governments that are simply not responsive uh, to the will of their people, as is the case in Russia. Matt, I wanted to ask you about former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's comments on MSNBC Monday talking about Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Remember, uh, the Russians invaded Afghanistan uh, back uh, in 1980, and uh, although no country uh, went in, uh, they certainly had a lot of countries uh, supplying uh, arms and advice and even some advisors uh, to those who were recruited to fight Russia. It didn't end well for the Russians. Uh, there were other uh, unintended intended consequences, as we know. But the fact is that a very motivated and then uh, funded and armed uh, insurgency uh, basically drove the Russians out of Afghanistan. I think that is the model that people are now uh, looking toward. Unintended consequences, Matt Duss? Again, mm. that's the yeah. former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Yeah, I would just— respond to that by saying it didn't end well for the Russians. It really didn't end well for anyone, uh, <laughs> least of all the people of Afghanistan themselves. So, you know, I certainly understand this may, you know, this invasion may backfire ultimately on Putin and on the Russian government. Um, but I think we should not see this in terms um, simply of using, you know, the Ukrainians as a tool of our foreign policy and our conflict with Russia. I think the goal needs to be to end this fighting um, as, as quickly as we possibly can, to use every diplomatic lever we can uh, to, to, to end this fighting. Um, and I think that should, that, that should be our focus. I wanted to quickly ask you about oligarchs. You referred to the Russian oligarchs. But you talk about the oligarchs on both sides. Yeah, that's right. I mean, what is an oligarch? It is a it's a very wealthy and politically influential person, um, just in the, its broadest definition. Certainly, there is a set of oligarchs um, that that have a lot of influence uh, in Russia. And let's understand one of the reasons why these oligarchs do have such power and wealth and influence is, uh, in large part, because of you know the kind of neoliberal um, shock therapy that was applied to Russia in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union, backed often by U.S. economists who effectively auctioned off, who, you know, urged Russia to auction off uh, the people's property. And it was it was gathered up by these oligarchs uh, for their own wealth. And Putin, you know, this led to such an economic collapse and economic hardship, that this in turn enabled the rise of a strong man like Putin, who, who um, you know, gathered the oligarchs under his own control. And this is certainly not the first time the United States has, has run this scam. Let's understand this kind of shock therapy has been applied in a number of countries around the world and has produced similar authoritarian uh, outcomes. Um, now, having said that, I think we also have, you know, we in our political system, while it is certainly not the same as Russia's, to say the least, we have a problem here of large concentrations of wealth and the political influence that that, that can buy in our system. Matt, I'd like to conclude by asking you about what you uh, imagine the trajectory of this conflict might be. I mean, what Hillary Clinton said about uh, unintended consequences uh, and, of course, also about the defeat of the Russians in Afghanistan, uh, the Soviets at the time in Afghanistan, is wrong. There are people who are expecting that this may turn out the same way, because even though the Americans and the Europeans have ruled out a, a no-fly zone, they are flooding uh, Ukraine with weapons. And uh, Russia, Putin doesn't show any indication 
of backing down, because as you pointed out, it's not clear how he would save face uh, or indeed how at this point he, th the Russians can extract themselves. What do you think uh, a resolution would look like? And, and do you think it's likely? Yeah, well, hopefully, I mean, the goal here, um, whether one agrees with it or not, I, I would say that the Biden administration's approach here has been fairly consistent for some time, which is to make clear um, to Putin um, that this invasion will be much more costly than he might have imagined. Um, and I certainly think that Putin is seeing that right now, both in terms of the, the strength um, and, the, and the breadth of the sanctions that have been um, applied on Russia, uh, with the U.S. working with its allies around the world, but also in terms of the Ukrainian resistance. Um, I think some of the casualties that you, you read out earlier, um, these are pretty remarkable. I think there are some estimates that put um, the number of, of, of Russian troops killed at around 7,000. We should be you know, cautious about, about those numbers right now, but let's just understand 7,000 would be as many troops as the U.S. lost in Afghanistan and Iraq almost combined in nearly 20 years. Um, so in terms of I, so the, the logic here is, you know, understanding that the Ukrainians themselves um, are resisting the Russian invasion. Um, I think they have a right to do so, certainly. Um, I think the goal should continue to be, or our focus should continue to be, what are the steps that end this fighting quickest, that that continue to support diplomacy? Um, yes, the Ukrainians are agreeing to meet once again with the Russians, as you noted, on, on the Belarus border, um, to find some diplomatic resolution here that ends the fighting. Um, but to be very honest, as I said earlier, given the, the, the aims that Putin has laid out, it's unclear to me if he is ready to take that off-ramp. Um, so for the time being, unfortunately, and it, it's enormously painful to say this, but I, 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 it's, it's hard for me to see how this stops anytime soon. Matt Doss, we want to thank you so much for being with us, foreign policy advisor to Senator Bernie Sanders. Uh, Matt Doss is a Ukrainian-American.